A teacher of history of the United States was brought to you by 49 dollarfights.com at 49 dollarfights.com they have a dedicated in-house team that specializes in streamlining the fight creation and maintenance process hello and welcome into a teacher of history of the united states thanks so much for joining us today did you know that mel gibson's character in the classic film the patriot was actually based on a real life American Revolution Patriot. And that the antagonist in The Patriot, played by actor Jason Ivicks, was also based off a, of a real, live British officer during the Revolution, both of which we'll talk about in this episode today. And that Virginian, Patrick Henry, before he said, give me liberty or give me death, he declared himself an American. Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because we will cover that and more in episode 53, The Who's Who of the American Revolution. Hello, welcome into class, and uh, I am joined again this week, as you could hear in the lead-in to the show, with none other than Mr. Bill Gorman. Bill, what's up, buddy? Good to have you can't on board get, uh, again. Can't get rid of me that easily. No, I can't. I can't. And as I mentioned last episode, really during our American Revolution series and probably into the founding, it will be a lot less of me solo, but I'm sure if we get into other periods of American history, there won't be people as interested in hopping on board. So, Bill, it's great to have you again on this episode, and I'm looking forward to it. We know that last week's episode was a long one, the what's what of the American Revolution. Bill and I had a great time recording that and going through everything, but we know that was an extended episode. This one will be another part two primer for the American Revolution series for you, except this one is the who's who of the American Revolution. And if you listen last week, it was abundantly clear that these were both my ideas, and Bill tried to take credit for them after the fact. Um, but those of you who are loyal listeners to the show know the real brains behind the operation, so I'm sure you can determine who's telling the truth here. Now, one thing I would like to bring up, it, Bill, what launched last week? Chris, our Patreon page yes. launched last week. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. Very exciting. It's a big day for a teacher's history of the United States. It is. Um, and you said that last episode too, but I would agree that one week later, each day Sorry, is, it was each day a is still day. a big day. <laughs> Each day is still a big day for a teacher of history in the United States. If you would like to find ways to support the show, please head over to patreon.com slash a teacher of history and check out our Patreon page and see if you can support us. Uh, each of the support levels are per episode of support, and we really appreciate any support you would be able and willing to give. But, you know, uh, we didn't mention this last week, and I do want to bring this up. This show will always be free. Um, it will always be provided by myself or Bill or Zach or other history nerds who join me um, to help you better learn and understand the history of the United States. And certainly the Patreon page is not replacing that free offer in any way. This will always be free and available to you. Um, if you are unable to support the show, we totally understand that. For those of you out there who are students or on fixed income and can't make that happen, that's no problem. We will always deliver the show to you for free. And can I just say, as someone who is a little unfamiliar with the Patreon concept coming into this, uh, it's... We're not asking, and I, and I didn't know. I was like, oh, my gosh, like, do they want, like, 20 bucks or 50 bucks for an episode? I didn't know. Like, we're doing some good stuff here, but really, everyone, all you listeners, th we have a level that's a dollar an episode. So I know, if, you know, if that's not, if that sort of level isn't possible, that's that's A-OK. -okay. But but I was even taken aback. I was like, I don't know what to expect here. But we have we have multiple levels, multiple uh, ways to, to support us. So it's not, it shouldn't be daunting. At least, um, that myth was dispelled for me. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, we're 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 pretty cheap. Pretty cheap. Affordable. Yeah, we're affordable. affordable. Good. I like that. I like that. We're affordable. Yeah, very good. We're, we're the affordable US history podcast. And very affordable if you don't contribute, because then we're free. And that's okay. Um, so, Bill, let's jump into it with the who's who in American history. So, how Bill and I broke this up is we basically have three different categories. We have the Americans, or the colonists at the time. We have uh, members of the British forces. And then the third category are other foreigners. We have a cavalry officer from Poland, we have a Prussian general, um, a few French commanders, so we'll talk about them too. And I passed along the names for Bill and I to cover on this episode, uh, the ones that I thought of. And there are a lot of other people that we will cover as we go through the Revolutionary Series who are not in this episode, including a few different women and other officers on, on both sides of the war. But for the sake of time, we're sticking to... Um, just the ones we're covering today. And for those of you who know Bill, it is very unsurprising that he quite literally chose to do his preparation on all of the Americans. So Bill is going to go into detail on all of the Americans that we're covering, and then I will cover uh, all of the Brits and the other foreign contributors to the Revolutionary War. So, Bill, how would you like to kick this off? Because Let's we're, start, we're sort of uh, figuring this out a, as we go with this podcast. I, I figure we could do it alphabetically, uh, frankly. Okay, uh, that's a um, very interesting and boring strategy. So, well, great. Uh, you know, maybe I'll jump around. I don't know. Okay. But, but uh, we're going to start with the Adams boys. Uh, the first, John Adams, a.k.a. the husband of Abigail Adams, okay. who, of course, rose to prominence. Uh, for his opposition in the Stamp Act. And you, of course, remember the episode that we did on the trials of the Boston Massacre. How could anyone forget that? Yeah. Uh, but as revolution and in case came... no one knew, in case no one knew, there's an HBO series called John Adams <laughs> that we may or may not watch. Because <laughs> we've never mentioned it before. As revolution became more imminent, Adams took on a leadership role in the colonial government. Uh, 1774, uh, as part of the First Continental Congress. In 75, he was actually one to nominate George Washington to be the commander-in-chief. 1776, he was instrumental in the drafting and the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. And during the Revolution, he served on over 90 committees, including serving as the head of the Board of War, which oversaw the Continental Army. Uh, 1779... Uh, John Adams was dispatched to negotiate what would become the Treaty of Paris, which would eventually bring the Revolutionary War to an end. So I think, Chris, you can you would agree that in terms of civil service, right off the bat, John Adams was hugely important. Oh, yeah. And I, well, I mean, we can track it all the way back to 1770 and the trials of the Boston Massacre. It it John Adams is and, and I I've said before that I think he's one of the most underrated president, uh, not necessarily because of what he accomplished, but because of his entire resume. Um, he is an American patriot and an American hero through and through, um, even though sometimes he was difficult to deal with, and apparently he uh, was the smartest person in the room. All you had to do was ask him, and he would tell you. His record of civil service is unmatched at this period for anyone um, outside of maybe Washington because of what Washington physically, the, the physical risk that Washington put himself in front of by, by taking up the army. We move on to the other Adams, Samuel Adams this time, the second cousin of John Adams. Uh, if you remember back to our episodes leading up to the revolution, well, these episodes, frankly, those last a half dozen to, to uh, or so episodes, Samuel Adams was instrumental in the Sons of Liberty movement. Uh, you'll remember his role in the Boston Tea Party and the Committee's Correspondence. Uh, he also served on the Continental Congress alongside John Adams, famously giving his speech American Independence on August 1st, 1776. Now, if you all remember back to last week, this was only a day before the Declaration of Independence would be signed. Samuel Adams would, would, would say... Our union is now complete, our constitution composed, established, and approved. You are now the guardians of your own liberties. He would continue, 
Go on, then, in your generous enterprise with gratitude to heaven for past success and confidence of it in the future. For my own part, I ask no greater blessing than to share with you the common danger and common glory. If I have a wish, then that would then that my ashes may be mingled with those of a Warren and Montgomery. It is that these American states may never cease to be free and independent. Samuel Adams, always knowing how to stoke the fires of revolution, he essentially stood before his fellow members of the Continental Congress, doubling down on the words of the Declaration of Independence, of pledging their sacred honor to the cause, knowing full well that if they fail, that they would be killed. Yeah, and I think Samuel Adams is more responsible. And, we, and we've covered this in our episode in, in the year 1771, 1772, 73, 74, when things were ebbing and flowing. Samuel Adams was right there on the front lines pushing this revolutionary idea forward all along. And he, more than anyone, is responsible for the fact that in April 1775, the war began. Now let's take a look at someone slightly more eclectic, we'll call it, and that's Benjamin Franklin. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm going to start listing out some words. Uh, Inventor, scientist, diplomat, statesman, founding father, abolitionist, womanizer. Benjamin Franklin could be described with any of those words. Uh, Franklin, and you spent a little bit of time talking about uh, Mr. Franklin, Chris. Yep. Uh, episode 48, um, I think, off the top of my head. I believe it was episode 48. Leading up to the revolution, uh, Franklin was actually over in London uh, as a colonial agent representing Pennsylvania, uh, he, where he would speak out against the Stamp Act directly to Parliament. In fact, he would pen uh, a pamphlet titled The Causes of the American Discontent Before 1768. This didn't not ingratiate himself to the British government, needless to say. Um, The part that really made me laugh is that during his time uh, serving as um, the deputy postmaster general over in London, he was actually sending the private letters of, guess who, Governor Thomas, Thomas Hutchinson, Hutchinson. Yep. back to the States. This is, it's, and that is part of the reason why Hutchinson became so freaking hated in that colony is yep. because Hutchinson would write about how these these basically scum of the earth uh, members of Boston and Massachusetts were so ungrateful, et cetera, et cetera. And they saw those writings firsthand. And that really, really made me laugh. Uh, yeah. And we covered that in episode, in, in episode 48, if you remember. Um, listening to that one, that's the reason why Franklin got dragged in front of Parliament in the first place and totally verbally abused, uh, and that solidified his desire to support the Patriot cause um, in the Second Continental Congress. So Benjamin Franklin, upon his return to America, was elected to the Second Continental Congress and appointed the first Postmaster General for the colonies. Uh, during the war, or during, excuse me, during the Revolution, uh, the, the build-up to official revolution, he assisted in the drafting of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, but he spent most, uh, really the entirety of the war, the war-fighting years, actually in France. Um, he was really, really should be seen as the first American ambassador uh, to France, uh, where he sought military and financial support. And ultimately, he spearheaded that uh, Treaty of Paris that we talked about last week that we'll get to in 1783. All right, Bill, who's next? Well, this next person has a special place in my heart and millions of others, uh, and I'd like to just play you a little snippet of why. All right, here we go. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished and squalor grow up to be a hero and a scholar the ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self-starter by 14 they placed him in charge of a trading charter 
All right, that was the $10 founding father, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, this immigrant, we're going to talk about far in far more detail as we move forward, especially into the founding of the country. But uh, he was a soldier. He started out as a soldier and rose up uh, to become a confidant of George Washington. He was there with him at the end, at the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, and, but per most, perhaps most importantly, uh, Alexander Hamilton's time serving with Washington during the Revolution, he saw the weaknesses of individual states vying for supremacy and the lack of essential authority that, uh, that the Articles of Confederation bred uh, after the war. This would inform much of Hamilton's post-Revolution thinking. Uh, yeah, and I mean, he will, he will go toe-to-toe with uh, John Adams at point with Washington like at times and mostly yeah. with yeah, yeah with Thomas Jefferson because they were just so diametrically opposed on how they how they viewed the world and he mostly agreed and got along with best uh, George Washington of the first three presidents diametrically opposed foes that's from the musical Chris there you go okay you go. Uh, for a second I actually <clears throat> thought you came up with a really good line no, <laughs> no it's uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda Let's move to a Virginian now, Patrick Henry. He really burst onto the scene uh, at the Continental Congress of 1774 by declaring that the distinction, that quote, the distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and New, Englander, and New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. And I know you've done that, Chris, but it bears repeating. He is an important it does. figure. I would agree with that. He's an, if nothing else, what this revolution was was fomenting was a, sh a sense of shared identity, and that was critical to banding 13 disparate forces together to fight the most powerful nation in the world at that time. Patrick Henry was trying to foster that. So a year later, Henry would again rise to speak, as a, this time as a member of the Virginia Convention. The debate was if a resolution, a resolution with the British could be attained through peace or force. Henry would state, quote, the war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. Henry would continue, The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? He would conclude with his most famous words, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. During the, re the revolution itself, Henry would first serve as commander-in-chief of Virginia's forces, but would quickly give that up um, and entered the political sphere and was actually elected uh, Virginia's governor. All right, up next, we'll stick with Virginians, and that's Thomas Jefferson. Of course, we'll get into TJ in, in far greater detail um, as we move forward in the revolution and the founding of the country. Uh, but right out of the gate, in my opinion, Mr. Jefferson is in the running to be the most consequential revolutionary figure. Uh, this Virginian was elected to the House of Burgesses, uh, where Jefferson wrote a summary view of the rights of British America, would, which would be an intro uh, to the Declaration of Independence and ultimately would lay some groundwork for the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Jefferson would also go on to serve uh, in the Second Continental Congress. Most notably, he was the lead drafter of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson's legacy, I think, is incredibly important to start talking about now. Uh, and that's because his legacy and literal impact of his time uh, hinged upon the success of the Declaration of Independence and what the future of America would be. And his creed that all men are created equal, which of course must be juxtaposed to how Jefferson lived his actual life. Yes, and that's a topic we'll be getting into in much further detail on this podcast. And actually, someone posed a question for the Q&A about the hypocrisy of American freedom uh, when you think about the enslaved Africans and African Americans at this time. That did not get posed uh, for the Q&A episode early enough, so we will talk about that in more depth on our next Q&A. All right, Chris, you know that I love the intersections of history and pop culture. And yes, so I do know we, that. We arrive at Francis Marion, who, um, if you remember back to last week when we were The talking, Swamp Fox. 
might I add. I have his I was, name. I was getting to that, and it's AKA the Swamp Fox. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <you>. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, if you recall back to last week when we were discussing the Battle of Sullivan's Island, Francis Marion actually popped up there as well, being third in command uh, of the Continental Forces in Charleston. So that intersection of pop culture and American history is seen with Francis Marion, a.k.a. the Swamp Fox, through the film The Patriot. Mel Gibson's character is loosely based on the exploits of Francis Marion. The interesting part, though, is that the exploits of Francis Marion were completely exaggerated and exacerbated by his biographer. The legend of his military prowess was actually... uh, created out of thin air his biographer wrote quote i have endeavored to throw some ideas and facts about general marion into the garb and dress of military romance end quote this uh, according to my research uh this same biographer also created the obviously apocryphal george washington and the cherry tree story why why are you doing that to francis marion i mean you're you're ruining Francis Marion oh, okay. for all the so, listeners so, of the podcast. So, man. of course, of course, Francis so why, why Marion. Why don't we talk about what, what did he do, Bill? So, Francis Marion uh, spent most of, it, of the war inside a fort in South Carolina. But when he was let that loose. That was not in the movie, for the No, record. it was not. <laughs> it would have been a very boring movie. Yeah. But what, what the movie got right, when Francis Marion uh, came out of the fort in November of 1780, he would begin that guerrilla style campaign against the British marching through the swamps, etc. Except the the film made Francis Marion, or rather Mel Gibson's character, out to be a Rambo of the American Revolution. Francis Marion wasn't that. This was hit and run, shoot and scoot kind of action through the backwoods of, of the American South. Aim small. Miss small. Yeah, very good. Very good. So Bill, according to the list I have here, you have one name left. Is that correct? That's right, Chris. Okay. It's the moment you've been waiting for, General George Washington. Nice, very good. And, and am I am am I playing another clip from from the musical Hamilton? Is that what you you would like me to do here, Bill? Yeesh. Okay, sounds good. All right, so let's run the clip. A second. Now I'm the model of a modern major general, the venerated Virginian veteran who's been around lining up to put me upon a pedestal, writing letters to relatives, embellishing my elegance and eloquence. But the elephant is in the room. The truth is in your face when you hear the British cannons go boom. Every hope of success is ble- So George Washington, the, the main event, so to speak, also a Virginian, seems to be a reoccurring theme. Uh, Washington is interesting, showed up to the Second Continental Congress in full military dress uniform. You could say he was auditioning for the job. After all, isn't the old expression, dress for the job you want, not for the job you have? Yeah, sure, we'll go with that. Um, At the Second Continental Congress, Washington was appointed Major General and Commander of the Colonial Forces against Great Britain. Uh, But I do want to take a second to talk about what that meant and who Washington was at that moment. Uh, He lacked any and all qualifications to wage war against the most powerful armed forces on the planet. And the reason for that, even knowing he was he's a veteran of the French and Indian War, he fought a frontier war, not one of open field style battles that he was about to face against the British forces across colonial America. He also had zero tactical experience with large infantry formations, cavalry, or artillery. And he, perhaps most importantly, and and as we talked about in Valley Forge on our last episode, he had no experience in managing a supply chain. So all of these downsides, yet there George Washington is in his full dress uniform, standing amongst a bunch of civil servants talking about freedom. And he's the one soldier in the room. Yeah. And then, and then they gave him the assignment, and then he said, oh, gosh, this is more responsibility than I could ever take up. I can't I can't believe, more or less, I can't believe I've been given this assignment. I'm blown away. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Washington was, I, I mean, just what an incredible figure in American history. And, of course, after the Revolution, we'll talk about George Washington a lot more. So I don't want to go into too much detail because this is an American Revolution primer. 
And I want to point out there were a couple people that Bill and I decided to leave out for the sake of time and because we will be talking about them so much more on independent episodes. One of that being Thomas Paine, the author of Common Sense, Paul Revere, the man, of course, who is famous for the Midnight Ride, James Madison, who we will get into in more detail in the founding of uh, the country. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Bill... Who is our sponsor here at Teacher History of the United States? Well, it's $49 sites, of course. Yes, of course, $49sites.com. And $49sites.com is who created and hosts and maintains our website now, and it is pretty awesome. Uh, They have sites optimized for desktop and mobile. The sites are custom designed by what you want. The content is written for you. Uh, or you can write your own content and they'll put it up there, which is what I ended up doing. But there's unlimited updates and monitoring, no startup costs. Uh, there's hosting, daily backups. And if you go to 49dollarsites.com and you decide to do business with them and type in the word history in checkout, you can upgrade to the Pro Package, which also provides you with Google Analytics, a photo gallery, uh, promotional pop-ups, Google Map intra- integration, text animation, an FFL certificate, and so much more. So if you go to 49dollarsites.com, the numbers 49dollarsites.com, check it out and use the promo code HISTORY at checkout to upgrade to the Pro Package for free. And so that do, that does it. And Bill, that's the end of the list, right? Washington was the last one. Well, I mean, end on a high note, right? Of course, of course, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so that brings us to the uh, Brits who participated in the war. And I'm going to go through some of the British politicians, commanders, and loyalists who were engaged in this war. And I will start with one that many Americans are very familiar with, and that is none other than the turncoat himself, Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold began as a colonial officer. He was an officer for the Continental Army. He was um, extremely influential at helping secure victories for the colonies at Ticonderoga, Quebec, Saratoga, and numerous other battles. He was trusted by George Washington, actually given command of West Point, and he was caught planning on surrendering West Point to the British, but his plot was spoiled, and this is something we will talk about in much more detail in a future episode. Um, Many historians believe his wife was intimately involved in the planning of this decision, and he ended up moving to Canada after the Revolutionary War, and was despised up there, too, um, because he was just seen as someone with very questionable character. And he eventually moved to London in 1791, never to return to the North American continent. Funny story about Benedict Arnold, Chris. Uh, He was, of course, a hero at the Battle of Saratoga and at the Monument in New York, uh, marking that that victory, that turning point in the American Revolution. He was was wounded during that battle. Mm -hmm. And so there is literally a boot there, a statue of a boot commemorating what he did, but nothing else. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, and we'll talk about that at Saratoga. His story is is a fascinating one because he really was an awesome soldier, and he had some pretty legitimate grievances with the Continental Army. Um, Not enough, of course, to become a traitor, but uh, he had some very good reasons to not be happy with how he was being treated. And we'll, we'll get into all of that in more detail. The next person I would like to cover in this episode is Thomas Gage. And I'll just cover him briefly because we've talked about Thomas Gage a lot. And we'll sort of be wrapping up his narrative here in the next few episodes. But he served in the French and Indian War. He actually fought alongside the great George Washington at the Battle of Monongahela with General Braddock. And from 1763 to 1775, he was commander-in-chief of the British forces in North America. In 74, he also became governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay. And he was eventually replaced by William Howe following the Pyrrhic victory at the Battle of Bunker Hill that we talked about last episode and sent back to England. 
and he died peacefully um, just over a decade later in Britain in 1787. Another British general that we will be, or British officer that we will be talking about, is Lord Cornwallis. Now, Lord Cornwallis comes up, and I mentioned him last week when talking about the Southern Theater of the War. He, he comes up really in the second half of the war more than the first. He fought in the Seven Years' War. He was given command of the British forces in 1776 and was a general during the war. He was very highly respected. Uh, he was a great military tactician, and the best moment of the war for him was likely his overwhelming victory at the Battle of Camden over uh, the other hero of Saratoga, um, Horatio Gates. In the U.S., more than anything, if you're familiar with him at all, and if not from the movie The Patriot, uh, he is most well known for his capitulation at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. And the fact that he really, um, if you were to point to one person who was responsible for the uh, surrendering of the British Army in the Revolution and losing the war, it technically would be Lord Cornwallis for obvious reasons. The next person I'd like to talk about is sort of the foil to Bill's uh, Francis Marion, or a.k.a. the Swamp Fox. There, does that sound good, Bill? Is that that's, how you want me to say it? That's perfect, Chris. Okay, great. Um, and that is Bannister Tarleton. And Bannister Tarleton was a young, hungry, and seemingly obnoxious and morally corrupt officer in the British Army. He became a military commander at the young age of 21, and he was sent over to the colonies um, right around that age. So he was very young and very inexperienced. He's infamous for his victory at the Battle of Waxhaws and the subsequent massacre of the surrounding Continental troops. He was given the nickname Bloody Ban, the Butcher, and the Green Dragoon. Uh, he moved back to England at the age of 27 after the war and moved on to have a very successful political career despite the fact that there were rumors flying around how he butchered and massacred innocent people during the war. And that's something that Bill and I will dive into much more detail in in a future episode. The last Englishman I would like to cover is the most impactful during this time period, and that is King George III. And Bill, I'd like to ask you, um, off the top of your head, any idea how long King George the Third reigned? Oh God, it was a long time. Wasn't it like thirty years or something like that? Way more. Forty. Keep going. Fifty. Sixty. Sixty years. I was only <laughs> half off. Yeah, I know. I know. It was crazy because you said 30, and that is a long time, yeah. and you were halfway there. Yeah. Um, he became king in 1760, and he reigned until 1820. Let me repeat. He was king for 60 years. He reigned during the Seven Years' War, the Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, many historians view his experience during the Revolution as one really full of missteps, and, and we've talked about King George in more depth in a previous episode, episode 36, which is titled The British Constitution and King George III. And uh, the critics of King George claim that he actively seemed to be keeping England and the colonies at war with each other. There's actually a Victorian author, George Trevelyan, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, but I doubt it, uh, who said that the king was determined to, quote, never acknowledge the independence of Americans and to punish their contumacy by the indefinite prolongation of a war which promised to be eternal. He continued in saying, the king wanted to, quote, keep the rebels harassed, anxious, and poor until the day when, by a natural and inevitable process, discontent and disappointment were converted into penitence and remorse. Now, whether this critique of how King George ruled during the American Revolution is accurate or not, it surely shows that, and many historians agree with this, King George likely put personal matters and personal vendetta and ego and pride ahead of likely what was best for the British Empire, especially in the la later years of the war. And 
you know, however, though, in all of this, m most more recent historians actually defend King George by saying that in the context of the time, no king would have willingly surrendered such a large territory. And his conduct was far less ruthless and unexpected than contemporary monarchs in Europe or than historians try to make it after the fact. And we'll be talking about him um, in more detail in anecdotal areas, so you can sort of uh, make your own make your own call on that. And now we're moving on to the last few people we'd like to cover here in the who's who. And we have four foreigners. We have two Frenchmen, a uh, Polish officer, and a Prussian officer. And I'll start with the first and the one that people are probably most familiar with, and that is the Marquis de Lafayette. Now, Lafayette? Yeah, now the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, his father died fighting the British, and some believe that that is one of the reasons why he was interested in fighting for the colonies in the American Revolution, while others recognize that he was a Freemason, and he likely just over time fell in love with the idea that the American people were fighting for their liberty and their freedom, and he wanted to be part of a fight like that one. At one point, he found out that French generals in 1777, I believe, the French generals were being sent to the colonies, and he jumped at the uh, opportunity. But that opportunity came to nothing. So he ended up actually buying a ship and traveling over to America on his own. Um, he, he had to turn around the first time and go back, and then summon the courage to get on the ship and go again. Um, because he kept having second thoughts. He had a very influential uncle-in-law who was determined to try to keep him from doing this and ruining the family name, etc., but he did it anyway. He ended up landing in South Carolina, traveled up to Philadelphia, and was welcomed being a, a Freemason. Uh, he had the support of Benjamin Franklin, and which we'll see is a running theme here with many of the foreigners who contributed to the American Revolution in notable ways, and he quickly gained the confidence of George Washington. He participated in numerous battles throughout the war. He returned to France as a hero in both countries. He was seen as a surrogate son, so to speak, to George Washington. Um, when he got back to France, he was promoted, skipping several ranks, and later worked alongside the United States in a diplomatic role and had a direct effect on the French Revolution. Um, so m the Marquis de Lafayette, and by the way, his actual name is just a total mouthful. Um, it's not even worth bothering me trying to pronounce it. So we'll just stick with the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, he was incredibly influential and, and j just a great story. Um, a man who voluntarily left his country to help, uh, others fight for their freedom and liberty. Um, awesome story. Another guy who did just that, and another guy who was recognized by Ben Franklin as being something very special, and Ben Franklin personally recommended that Casimir Pulaski uh, be sent over to the colonies, and that Franklin get or that Washington give him the opportunity to command a cavalry regiment. Casimir Pulaski was a Polish nobleman, and nicknamed the father of the American cavalry. He wrote, "Quote: I came here." where freedom is being defended, to serve it, and to live or die for it. Pulaski had displayed incredible leadership and courage um, all throughout his life in battle, and this was a guy who was not afraid of dying. He was the brilliant cavalry commander who would actually lead the charge, which, in retrospect, is not the wisest thing to do. Um, but after he came over to the colonies and began to fight, for the colonists in the American Revolution, he displayed incredible leadership at the Battle of Brandywine, basically saving George Washington's life and earning the rank of Brigadier General. Later in the war, after rubbing some people the wrong way, he recruited men from the city of Baltimore to create the Pulaski Cavalry Legion, and they fought in numerous battles and were very successful. He died a heroic death after being struck by a grape shot in the siege of Savannah later in the war. And anecdotally, um, Route 40, U.S. Route 40, run, runs east to west, and it is 220 miles long. And it runs right through the city of Baltimore. And 
in the city of Baltimore, especially on the eastern half of the city, it is actually nicknamed Pulaski Highway. And I lived here for a couple years before I ever became curious enough to wonder why it was nicknamed Pulaski Highway and if it had something to do with Casimir Pulaski, who I had known from reading about in the American Revolution. And it does, because he recruited men from Baltimore to create his cavalry legion. And so there's actually a highway in Baltimore named after Casimir Pulaski and a huge statue of him in Patterson Park. Um, and it, it seems very out of place in downtown Baltimore to have a huge statue of Casimir Pulaski. But uh, it's there, and it's really cool. And there's also another one um, of Lafayette, about 10 blocks north of Pulaski, right here in Baltimore on Orlean Street. So there you go. Um, and, and I know that uh, Lafayette especially has statues of him all over the country. So it's DC, not totally, New York, not totally I surprising. Think both of those, yeah. Right? Oh yeah. All, oh, all over, all over. But having Pulaski and Lafayette uh, within within a fifteen minute walk of each other here is is pretty cool. There are two more foreign contributors that I had planned on bringing up, but we'll just talk about one of them. Uh, they were the Baron von Steuben and the Comte de Rochambeau. But we'll talk about von Steuben in much more detail when we. Uh, go through the episode on Valley Forge. So I'd like to focus our last sort of mini biography here for the who's who of the American Revolution on the Comte de Rochambeau. He was the commander of all the French forces in America during the War for Independence. And he is, his most notable contribution came during the Yorktown campaign where he collaborated with Washington to force the surrender of uh, Lord Charles Cornwallis and all of not yeah all of his army which more or less ended the revolutionary war for all intents and purposes the Rochambeau had, he fought in the seven years war against the English and he really was waiting for an opportunity to fight against the English again and that came in 1780 when King Louis the 16th promoted him to lieutenant general and the command of the expeditionary force that was sent to America to support France's new alliance with the U.S. He came over with about 5,500 French troops, landed in Rhode Island July 10th of 1780. And Rochambeau will play a role in working directly with George Washington and commanding the French troops in the colonies. And we'll talk about the incredible impact that the French had on helping the colonies win the Revolutionary War, and Rochambeau was a linchpin to all of that. All right, Bill, anybody else we want to cover? We, we just covered a lot of people and a lot of stuff. Again, for like the third week in a row, it's just been a, a deluge of information for the listener. Well, like I said last week, I think it was important to do this simply because there's so much information that has to be absorbed to truly start getting a comprehensive look at this period in our history. Um, I'm so thankful for the listeners who hung in there. I know this was another pretty yeah. lengthy marathon info date who like personality, all that kind of stuff was just flying around. Um, so I, I again, thanks for hanging in there with us, but I think uh, going through these certainly Chris's recap uh, of the first however many episodes and followed by our primers getting us ready uh, to talk in far greater detail about the events and people that made up the American Revolution will make this the, these lengthy episodes worth it for the listener. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, and hopefully our intention is that these two primer episodes this week and last week really help lay a solid foundation for you to understand the context of the things we're talking about as we move forward. So please let us know what you thought about these. Um, this wraps it up for episode 53, the who's who of the American Revolution. We really appreciate you sticking around for it, and we are excited because next week we get back to the narrative, and we've been off the narrative for four episodes now, and now we get back to it. So it will be myself, Bill, and Zach next week, episode 54, The Shots Her Around the World and the Battles of Lexington and Concord. Thanks so much for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.
If you'd like to raise your hand and participate, please feel free to reach out. You can find us on Twitter at A Teacher's Hift. You can reach out to us on Facebook, The Teacher's History of the United States Podcast, or shoot us an email, chris at a teacher's history.com. If you could leave a rating or review on iTunes, or even more importantly, go to our Patreon page and show support for the podcast, that would really mean a lot to us. See you next week.